I want to talk to you about, if you've seen it uh, uh, posted on Facebook, it's Extreme Earth Makeover. Extreme Earth Makeover uh, is the idea here this morning. Second uh, Peter chapter 1, if you have your Bibles this morning, otherwise you can look at it on the screens or on your smartphones or tablets. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. I'll be using the New American Standard uh, Version Bible this morning. Uh, Richard Baxter was a 17th century preacher in, in England. And uh, the man, though he had a very effective work in England, was very uh, prone to uh, different types of diseases and uh, just the feebleness of his own body. At one point in time, he was 35 years old and laying on his deathbed, thinking that this was it, that he was going to meet the Lord. And so in the midst of that, he thought, well, why not just focus on heaven? Why not just put my mind in and meditate upon what heaven has to offer me and all the joys of what heaven will be. And he said that he was actually surprised that as he began meditating every day upon heaven, that he uh, immediately began to recover in his body. And he lived a a, a regular normal life, uh, though plagued at times by these illnesses. And I think what uh, uh, Richard Baxter had grasped is is that there is something powerful uh, involved in disconnecting from this broken earthly world and connecting to the perfection of everything that heaven has to offer us. That we can constantly be uh, downed by the facts that this is a broken life, a broken world. Our bodies, if you had any question uh, about the fact that they're breaking down, when you wake up in the morning, you remember the aches and pains of uh, of our own bodies and know that this is a broken world, but there's something beautiful that heaven has to offer us. And we are comforted by the fact that one day all things will be made new. And so I think that in the midst of this, as we are going to look into the text, that there's something deeply ingrained in our being that desires to see something remade to see something new, to see something that's old become new again. Uh, Ryan, uh, we picked up this uh, uh, baby grand keyboard in Shelbyville. A person donated it to the church, and uh, it was ugly before it ever got here to this building. Um, It had places on the top of it that potted plants had set for probably 30 years, and you could see the potted plant you know, where it used to be. And uh, uh, Ryan took it home to his workshop, and now you have this beautiful uh, baby grand piano that you see now. And so, uh, uh, believe it or not, it has no guts inside of it. Uh, It's the keyboard that we've always had is stuck inside of it, and Ryan custom-fitted it so the keyboard would be in there. But you would be able to look at it and see this beautiful baby grand piano. And so uh, it's the old becoming new inside of it. You'll never have to tune that piano ever again. It's never going to go out of tune because it's all digitalized inside. See, the beauty of it is, is that we love to see something that's broken down become once again new. This is why we love to see people get healed. Because they're broken, they're hurting, they're diseased, and yet God heals them and they're remade. Our entire Christianity is, is depth of what it is, is is this desire within us to see transformation. The old become new, the, the old to be remade. And I think it's this deepest part of our humanity that we desire to see all of it. There are television shows that have been on the air uh, for decades that are based on this whole idea. Bob Vila and this old house, right? He takes an old house and he makes it new again. The show still airs over and over again because people love to see something be remade to become new once again. And so I think what we find is, is in the essence of this, is, is that God's uh, a revelation of himself to humanity, it's how God chose to renovate the earth and how he chose to convey uh, to us the life of Jesus displayed in Scripture. 
So if you would remember a few weeks ago, I talked about King Nebuchadnezzar and uh, how Nebuchadnezzar saw this great statue in Second Kings chapter 2. I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel d- describes for him what the dream and the vision that he had was uh, in this paradox of what the future of his life would be. And he sees this great statue made of gold and silver and, and uh, bronze and uh, clay and steel. And so what happens to it is it's broken down by a rock that was cut without human hands all the kingdoms of the world will pass away but the rock cut without human hands will last forever and what it ultimately says is that rock grew in size and became a mountain and filled the earth is what it says and what is happening is nebuchadnezzar was finding out that all the things that he built will perish but everything that god builds will last forever When he remakes something, it lasts eternally. Everything will be made new. So let's look at 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through 21. It says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. The Mount of Transfiguration is what he's describing. So we have this prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention to it, as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the act of a human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Have you ever questioned yourself, why in the world do I want to be happy? What is it in me that desires uh, uh, to be happy, or not just to be okay per se, but to be happy and not sad? Why do we even know what sadness is if there wasn't happiness? What is it deep within us that desires happiness or perfection? Uh, Something to be remade, something to be new once again. I have started this project on my uh, 2002 Cobia 191 Bay boat. It had this old bottom coat on it from Florida uh, where it inevitably came from in the beginning. And so this was looking bad and old and worn down. So I got a, a media blaster, it's called, and walnut shells, and I spit the walnut shells out at the boat and it begins to strip the hull off to make it new again but you know what in the midst of that uh, i have to wonder why in the world am i worried about it in the first place why do i want that boat to look like it was from the beginning why do i want everything that i have to look good rather than bad And so in the midst of that, C.S. Lewis would say this. He said that the reason that you want to be happy, the reason that you even have the desire or the understanding of what perfection is, is because you desire to go back to the place where you came from in the first place. You desire eternity. You desire heaven itself. And God is pushing us towards heaven, pushing us towards perfection in all that we are. For the painful things to be washed away and for the new things to come on from heaven to earth. And so this story of transfiguration happens and Peter, James and John are on that mountain and they see Jesus lifted up from the, uh, into the clouds and he has changed, he's transformed before their eyes. Uh, Luke says in his gospel that Jesus was transformed into dazzling white. I mean his clothes shone uh, dazzling in color like he was scrubbed down with Crest toothpaste or something like that. And Jesus seen here is most likely talking to in the heavens with Moses and Elijah. Because Peter, Peter says, I want to build three tabernacles. You know, let me commemorate this experience. I want to build three tents so that we can kind of bottle up everything that God has shown us uh, there at that moment. And However, Peter is divinely interrupted and God covers them over with a shadow and they become afraid. And essentially God is saying, okay, Peter, shut up. Be quiet. And now in Luke 9.35, the original experience of the transfiguration, a voice comes from heaven in a cloud and it says, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. 
And sometimes I think in life we just need to be quiet and listen to the words of God. Listen to the words of Jesus. Because our answers, because our abilities are overshadowed by Jesus' words anyways. We think we have wisdom in our own minds, but it's Jesus' words that we need to listen to. And what is glimpsed by on that mountain by Peter, James, and John was this elusive fullness of the presence of God. And Peter, in some valiant effort, was trying to contain it, to bottle it up, to make a monument to it, to build a statue or to make a mausoleum, if you will, of God's presence. But if you remember what happened on the day of Jesus' death, that there was a veil in the temple where God's presence dwelt between the cherubim. And the veil that separated all of humankind from the presence of God was torn from top to bottom. So that God's presence no longer dwelled in buildings made with human hands. But rather God's presence vacated the temple built with human hands. And now His presence dwells among the followers of Jesus. And anything else is some sort of monumental idolatry when we try to say, well, God's presence dwells here. God's God's presence dwells in this place and this time. Because if God vandalized the temple and left it, then certainly He's among His people. And that's where God's presence is today. But I can't help but think at times that we get into this mode of, of, of wanting the old, the glory days, if you will. I mean, sometimes I, I think fondly about the memories of my own you know, childhood, growing up in a church much like this, and, and remember the altar times and down here with uh, all the other kids and praying for people. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just saw somebody that needed Jesus at the altar, and I went down and I laid hands and, and I prayed for them. And I glorify that in my mind, but I have to remember that what God did in the past was good, but the future is always going to be better. And I think sometimes we'll stand here and we'll, we're like, Lord, send the rain, send the rain. But we're asking for the former rain and not the latter rain. Lord, send the rain like you did before. Rather than saying, Lord, send the rain like you're going to do in the future. I want the latter rain. The former rain isn't as good. The latter rain is always better. It's always better. And so we see uh, in the midst of this that Peter is essentially giving his exegesis or his interpretation of the event that he had seen He eyewitnessed it himself. This is the beauty of what we see in the gospel narratives. Is is that what you experience when you sit down and you read the scriptures is eyewitness account. This is why you can sit and read the scriptures and say, this is God's word to us. Because they interpreted it, they wrote it down as they saw it, because they were witnesses of God's glory, majesty, and power in the first place. You can sit and read the Scriptures, and you can listen to sermons preached on the Scriptures, then know and be confident that that is God's Word, because they saw it happen and unfold before their very own eyes. And so Peter is giving his uh, interpretation. He says this is something very interesting. He ties it to the second coming of Jesus, the transfiguration uh, and the second coming of Jesus. He ties them together and he says this is the parousia. This is the Greek word meaning the arrival of Christ on earth again. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we saw it happen. We saw a foretaste of it. This had multiple implications, I believe. One is that in the Eastern Church's context, uh, like the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, the transfiguration was a cosmic foretaste of the transfiguration of all creation in Christ. Even to the early church fathers and mothers, the transformation was not just of their physical bodies, but it was all of earth itself. It was the extreme makeover of what earth would happen. And Jesus floating in the skies and being transformed into dazzling white is this foretaste of what we will experience one day in the future. And so uh, uh, I try to think of this, that somehow uh, all of humanity is trying to go back to what the Garden of Eden was like, you know, in perfection and what it was to the beginning. 
Uh, if you've ever been to Naples, Florida, and you drove around the streets of these beautiful uh, manicured places, I mean, the grass, it doesn't look like there's a blade too long or too short. The palm trees are perfectly trimmed. Everything looks perfect. Except then a hurricane comes through and everything's destroyed once again, right? Uh, uh, the, the other day I was out in my yard and I was trying to get rid of some of the weeds in my yard. And my neighbor, Chili, comes over and she says, you know you're not going to pull all those weeds out of the yard, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a reminder to me <laughs> that the world is broken and all of my desire to remake it, to manicure it, to try to make it perfect so that my lawn doesn't have all these yellow weeds growing in it. It's impossible. Because the world is not perfect yet. It's broken and we are moving towards perfection, but we are not there yet. And it's this constant reminder. Uh, have you ever seen the show When Animals Attack? Anybody ever seen that before, right? Inevitably, it's somebody who is doing an interview or something like that, sitting in front of a camera, and they've got like a 400-pound bear next to them, and they're doing this interview, and all of a sudden, the bear looks over at the lady next to her and just mauls her, I mean, just grabs her and shakes her. And they think, well, we've reversed what happened in the fall of creation. You know, we've, we've taken animals and we've gotten rid of their wild instincts. We've domesticated them. Remember, you can be petting your domesticated cat. He loves you, sits on your lap, and all of a sudden she'll just grab your arm and bite you. Why? Because it has this primal instinct within it to do the opposite of what you're doing. And the reality is, is when Jesus says that the lion will lay with the lamb in revelation, in the revelation of all that God brings together in the fullness of perfection, that everything will be perfect one day. And we eagerly desire that where earthquakes and storms and mudslides and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes will all cease to exist when the cosmos are transformed by God Himself. Even the dog whisperer cannot restore communication with the animal world like God can. So the word itself, transfiguration, is a Greek word that we uh, say metaphormeu is the word, which we obviously gather our word in English is metamorphosis when we talk about the chrysalis and the caterpillar turning into the butterfly and everything. In Romans 12, Paul the Apostle uses the same word, and he talks about being conformed or transformed in the metamorpheu by the renewing of your mind. You may become transformed into the image of God, into the image of Jesus. And uh, so there's this uh, renovating where you rip out the old and you put in the new. Uh, So I've experienced this just recently. The uh, most probably major thing that I've had to do to my house so far is, is that when they did the home inspection, he told me that the downstairs bathroom was leaking from the wax seal. And I absolutely just ignored it. I'm like, I just don't want to deal with it. I hate wax seals. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to use wax in the first place uh, to seal a toilet to the floor. Uh, But uh, whatever. It's messy. It's disgusting. And I know that I had to do it. So eventually I pulled up the toilet and found out that it had leaked to the point where it had destroyed part of the subfloor. And so now I had to renovate, if you will, rip out the old, broken, torn apart stuff uh, where the water had damaged the floor, bleach the snot out of the thing, and then put it all back together. And so uh, the renovation of that and putting down new flooring and new things uh, it lets us capture the moment that nothing in this life is eternal. But it's all breaking down. The second law of thermodynamics says that that everything that has energy is breaking down and coming to dissolution and going to fizzle out, if you will. But when I finished up the floor and it looked nice and it looked good, I took pictures of it, I texted it to five different people, and then uh, the, the bathroom was all back together. Becca came down and caulked all the seams of it and everything. It looked great. And then I just would go into the bathroom and I'd just stand there and I'd just stare at it. Man, that looks good. You know, I did a good job on that, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty good, isn't it? You know, and you just stared at something that was old and broken becoming new. This is why people go to car shows and they see these old cars from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and they just stare at them. Wow, 
Did that have a bunch of rust on it? I mean, was that broken? Look at the engine you did in that thing. You know, they love to see something old become new again. And we stare at the beauty of it. But there is this paradox in the midst of it that you have to rip out the old to bring in the new. And so in the midst of this earth recreation, I can tell you that I bet you things will get worse before they will get better. Because if the earth is going to be remade, if it's going to be renewed, there's a certain level of tearing out that has to make room for the new kingdom of God to come from heaven to earth. The old kingdom has to go. The new kingdom will come. And the glory of God is a paradox of human glory. Just like I experienced the glory of God by being discipled by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures and in the Spirit, and uh, through this finding glory, not through some type of human pedestal, but rather Christ in His light in the darkness, and triumph through defeat, and greatness in loneliness, and freedom through obedience, and life through death. All of Jesus' life, all of Christianity points us to this fact that things are being renovated to the point where it's not me living, but rather it's Christ living in me. I know it's a paradox of life in the individuality of the Western world. Man, you just got to be you. Be yourself, right? You hear it over and over again. Just be who you are. But in the reality is, is that God wants to take us, the shell of the human beings that we are, the tabernacle of our own bodies, rip us apart and put His identity in us. So it's not us living, but it's Christ living in me. And we are totally changed by the power and the Spirit. That's why all of Scripture points to the fact that it's not uh, uh, your soul becoming eternal, but rather it's you being reborn, a new creation in Christ. That's the eternality of the soul that we understand in the Scriptures, is by only us having new life. Jesus sets foot on the scene and He takes dead things and He makes them new things. So a strength of any prosecutor is in the fact that he has an eyewitness account. I mean, any prosecutor that has an eyewitness has the ability to take uh, uh, really and just demolish any type of evidence uh, that would point to the opposite. When he says, I have this person who was there and can verify the fact that this person uh, did the criminal act or whatever it may be. And so the gospel narratives come to us from these firsthand accounts as they're recorded and remember the events of the life of Jesus and the aid of the Holy Spirit. And Peter is saying, don't just trust the story, trust me too. Because I was there. I saw it happen. It's true. I know Jesus is coming back before us because He showed us the glimpse of His glory in eternity. The glimpse of what it will be like to be transformed, to be like Jesus. So every Thanksgiving in my family, the Wilsons, you know, it's, it's the paradox of human life that my aunts and uncles are old now and they don't want to do Thanksgiving anymore. They don't want to host it anymore. So I move home to Kentucky thinking, yeah, I get to take part in all of these family activities. And they don't even have Christmas and Thanksgiving anymore. I mean, what's up with that? It doesn't make sense. So they're tired of it. They're like, you guys, it's your generation's turn to take it over. I said, well, that's fine, but you've got to come to Frankfurt. I'm not coming to Alexandria, right? You've got to come to my house on my terms. And none of them show up. So anyway, uh, but in this midst of, of, of what Thanksgiving was to me and my memories of Thanksgiving, I remember that uh, we would have... All the ladies would go upstairs. We did it in the basement because there were so many people, big family. And all the ladies go upstairs and they bring out all the food. And it was like this blessed procession, you know, what it would have been like to walk into a king's banquet. And all these people come down the stairs and they have all this food. And then the food is passed around. But there was this one dessert that got passed around first that if you didn't get a piece of it uh, right there at the beginning, you aren't going to get any of it. It was just strawberry sort of cream cheese, uh, pecan crusted, and uh, a beautiful dessert. And if you didn't get it right at the beginning, you weren't going to get any of it. And then if you got up to go get some gravy or something else or coffee or a drink, they would eat it. They, your friends, your cousins or whatever, they would eat your dessert. 
And then you wouldn't have anything. So to secure your dessert, you had to eat it right there at the beginning. I mean, as soon as the prayers finished, I mean, you ate the dessert. So it was gone. You had it. It was done. You knew that you secured that portion. And this is what Peter and James and John are experiencing They are seeing the dessert of the future. They're taking part of it in the beginning right now before it ever happens. They're experiencing the fullness of the dessert of the eschaton, the dessert of the end of time. And that's the beauty of what we experience as we ourselves are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So if you would remember a story of an eyewitness testimony. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? Jesus stops to rest at the well, and there's this woman there. Uh, She's there at an untimely time of day, during the middle of the day, when the sun is the brightest. The women would uh, draw water in the beginning of the day or at the end of the day when the sun was not hot. You had to carry the water all by yourself. There was no running water. There was no uh, uh, modern efficiencies, and it was the woman's job to do this very task. And so here is this woman, a Sumerian woman at the well in the middle of the day. It's most likely that she was some type of prostitute. She had had five husbands, and the man that she was with was not her own. Whatever the situation in the culture it was, Jesus engages her and speaks to her. And so in the midst of that conversation, uh, uh, Jesus tells her who she is. And then she identifies the fact that this man must be the Messiah. He must be the Christ. Because she says in John 4:25, uh, "I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us." And Jesus said to her, "I that speak to you am he." You see what she wanted was the revelation of all things. She wanted to know the mysteries of life, the mysteries of religion, the mysteries of how to live human life. And Jesus was the only one that could reveal them to her because he's the only one that's been in the end of time to begin with. So the Messiah would declare all these things, make the hard things about life and God and worship and humanity clear. But the methodology of Jesus' declaration of all things is quite different. Rather than coming to the earth and teaching a list of laws and regulations, much like the Mosaic law, he told stories. He didn't give laws, he told stories. Parables is what they were called. He demonstrated not just in word, but he demonstrated in deed also. So this is my issue, is that I would be very leery of a church or a pastor or any leader who may declare some type of gospel or truth to you, but never actually do what the gospel or the truth says. You see the dichotomy between this. is is be leery of a person that will proclaim what they say is truth, but never actually live the truth out. And something powerful happened uh, to me uh, last week as as we retold the story of the great banquet in our Thanksgiving meal here at church. We invited all these people that they would come. Anybody who would come was published in the newspaper, published abroad, on the Internet, all those things, invited people um, from all of the community. We asked them to come in. And then we did that kind of recapitulation of the of the uh, story of the great banquet. And we got back in the van, P- uh, Brother Turley, the missionary, uh, myself, and uh, Jonathan Payton all jumped in the van, and we went back downtown. We went to the men's uh, uh, home, we went to the women's home, and to the Simon house. And then we also went to underneath the bridges of Frankfurt. And here, Brother Turley, uh, Steve Turley, and myself... We are jumping over guardrails. The van pulled off on the side of the road, and we're down underneath the guardrails and under the bridges looking for the lost. And I said to Brother Turley, I said, don't you feel a little bit like Jesus looking for the one sheep, leaving the 99 and looking for the one? I mean, don't you feel a little bit like this is what Jesus would be doing at this very moment to compel all who would come in? And somehow in the midst of this, this pietistic effect that when we do what Jesus did, our lives are transformed by it. That we are changed as we share the gospel in a way that Jesus shared the gospel. When we look for the lost like Jesus looked for the lost. And something happens in this transformational way 
I can guarantee you that Brother Turley will always remember the day that he came to Frankfurt and looked under the bridges for the lost and the dying, the sick and the poor. So Peter directly addresses the issue that some have said that these stories about Jesus' return are just myths, epics of the culture, if you will. Eugene Peterson writes that Jesus did not just teach us what to think, but rather he teaches us how to think. Rather than explain things line by line as a set of laws, Jesus told stories called parables. He didn't give us three points in a poem. He proclaimed freedom for the captives, and then he went and he freed the captives. He proclaimed healing for the sick, and then he went and healed the sick. He proclaimed the resurrection from the dead, and then he rose from the dead. And so Peter is addressing this very issue. It's not an epic of culture. It's not just a story. The Epicureans, who were students of Greek philosophers, held that Greek mythical stories of punishment were simply invented to be instruments of moral control and to keep people in fear. But that's not what Jesus came to do. You see, Jesus didn't keep people in fear or come to control people, but he came to set them free. He didn't come to put people in bondage to fear. He came to vanquish all fear of judgment of your sins. He didn't just come to make immoral people moral. He came to make dead people live. Everything that Jesus said he was going to do, he did while he was on earth. And I can guarantee you that according to Peter's testimony, is that he saw the first fruits, he saw the inkling of what it would be like to be resurrected as Christ was resurrected. So if Jesus says, I will not leave you alone on this earth, but I will come back for you, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, you can guarantee, first of all, that there is a place for you to go when you die or you leave this earth. And you can also guarantee that Jesus is coming back for you. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who remain, is what Paul says. And the beauty of this thought of the transfiguration is is this is what it will be like in the future. And Peter, James, and John are seeing this vision of the resurrection of the dead and what it will be like. So the Gospel Herald once reported that there was a first cousin of the late Queen Victoria who uh, was saved by the Gospel and then went to Canada and traveled all over Canada to preach the Gospel. And he was in one place at a time when he knew of a man as he was walking down the street to the church. He saw this man. He was chopping wood for dinner. And so uh, as he walked past him, he knew that the man was in a, what we would call in churchy words, backslidden state. He wasn't serving the Lord anymore. And so as he walked past, he just issued this small reminder, like the transfiguration was Peter, James, and John. He said, the Lord is coming, brother. The Lord is coming. And he said that that man who was chopping wood was transformed at that moment of the reminder that Jesus was coming from heaven to earth to return for us. He said it went to the depths of his heart like the axe went into the wood. He said that was all the reminder that he had to give him. The man walked past, not saying a single other word, only that the Lord was coming. And the man's life was radically transformed. He gave his heart back to the Lord. He gave his whole life back to what he went, uh, what, uh, the Lord, as he served the Lord in the first place. You see, the beauty of it is we know that the encouragement we need for the transformation of our lives is, is that Jesus is coming. His return is imminent. At any moment, the Lord can and will return. And it cuts to our hearts as we remember. One last thing I think that Peter is saying is, is that this transfiguration on the mountain, what he stood there and he watched before his eyes, it cannot be bottled up. It can't be contained in the tent or memorialized because it was this little taste of what was coming. It's a foretaste of what we will see soon. When we see Jesus coming in the skies, but when He comes, we will not just be talking to a Moses and Elijah. When He comes, He will calling, be calling us up towards Him to be with Him in the clouds. And we too will be resurrected from the dead, changed and transformed. 
And next time Jesus comes, Peter, James, and John, and you and I will not have a single foot on the ground. But we will be transformed into dazzling white like Jesus and floating in the skies with the global body of Christ Himself. So if you think about this, that at the end of time, it will be the first time when the whole global body of Christ living and dead, bodily, physically, will be gathered together with the head of the church in one single place, at one single moment. Can you imagine how glorious of a church service that will be? A gathering together of the body of Christ. And we will have these transformed body like Jesus had. And plus, I'm pretty sure that we can break the grounds of, of gravity and we can fly and we can probably go wherever we want to at that point in time. We will not be held in by any type of time issue or gravity issue. Uh, and so we see amidst the beauty of this is what we call the rapture. And I really think it is a kind of a funny thing when we think about the rapture. It just means the word, uh, it's not in the Bible, the word itself, it, but it means just a catching up. Meaning that we will be caught up in the skies with Jesus. And so if you think about it, it's kind of a paradox in itself because it says we will go up to be with the Lord in the skies. Uh, but if you're in North America and the United States, you'll go up into the northern hemisphere. But if you're in Australia, won't you go down into the southern hemisphere? And so we'll be, you know, how does that work exactly? But I think the essence of what is, he's saying is, is that there is no place on earth that can contain the global body of Christ, both the living and the dead. There's no way. You've got to have it in the skies, in those three dimensions, in the fullness of what the sky is like, so that you could contain the fullness of all of the body of Christ together in one place at one time. And so if we were to understand it doesn't really matter in all of how the mechanics of it happens. What matters is that we will be gathered together with the Lord Jesus Christ in our changed and transformed bodies and be like Him. Yeah. Worship team, if you could come. But I think what we desire is to experience the transfiguration in our own lives. But I think if we're going to experience the transfiguration, we're going to experience this extreme makeover of earth itself then we have to listen to what God said in the clouds that day. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. To listen to the words of Jesus that transforms our life today. The fullness of the mystery of the transfiguration is that the transfiguriza transfiguration it, uh, and all that exists is for you and for I, for all of earth itself. In all of the history of the world, there is only one renovation, only one transformation that becomes the hinge point of all understanding of the past, the present, and the future, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The greatest renovation of all time, where the dead become living. Without the resurrection, Christianity itself will lose all of its power and all of its significance. It's a permanent victory over mortality. But it's also a seeded event. A seed event. Where the resurrection will come for all of humanity. And this is what the transfiguration is about. We are eagerly awaiting the renovation of our bodies. The old becoming new. The dead coming to life. The broken being made whole. All of earth and its contents. All of the universe being made over. And victory being made permanent if anything in the wars of history can teach us something is is that victory in this life is temporary but victory in jesus life is eternal and lasts forever and all the only way that we understand all the scriptures both the old and the new testaments is to look at jesus in the gospels jesus the apostles wrote about the Paul worked his teachings out from about the church, that Jesus. And John received his revelation about. And then we read the scriptures in light of Jesus' death, his resurrection, and ultimately his return to earth. And so what Peter is saying is, is that you can be sure that it's going to happen because I've seen it, I've tasted it, I've experienced it what it will be like when I saw the majestic glory and the voice from heaven and I watched Jesus floating in the skies 
And he saw the inkling of what it would be like as Isaiah says, I saw one as the Son of Man coming in the skies in glory. This is the beauty of what human life is that we experience when we experience the transfiguration of ourselves and we wait upon it and wait upon the Lord for His return. And I think we know by two major proofs the eyewitness testimony that was observed of Jesus, the fact that Peter, James, and John went up on the mountain and they watched Jesus practice His return from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus do His practice run, if you will. His practice lap. His rehearsal of the parousia. The arrival of Jesus on earth again. So I can't help but remember uh, the many times in youth group that I would stand before this big crowd of kids, 20, 30 kids at times. A lot of them... Wesley and William's age and younger kids and I would boil all the message the gospel message down to one little simple fact do you want to experience the recreation the recreation of what Christ can do the transformation of what God can do in you and I would watch as these little kids hand after hand would raise their hands and say I want to experience Jesus I want to be changed. I want to be transfigured to become like Jesus. And I'll never forget when my son Wesley, he was like four years old, the first time I saw him raise his hand. He raised his hand and he said, yeah, I want to experience Jesus. I want to be transformed into the image of Jesus. I want to be changed. And in all of our life is waiting It's this desire to be transformed in the fullness of who Jesus is. It's experience the the transfiguration right now, right at this point, experiencing the extreme makeover of our souls, of our lives. So there's a story about a little boy who uh, eagerly desired to uh, come to the Lord and uh, his parents were talking to him about it and But one evening at dinner, the boy had Cheerios for dinner, and he finished his bowl of Cheerios, and he said, I'm ready to give my heart to the Lord. The little boy went over the sinner's prayer with his parents, and then he got up from the table, and he went to his room, and his parents, wondering what he was doing, followed him into the room, and they watched him begin to pack his suitcase. And his parents said, well, you know, honey, what are you doing? Why are you packing your suitcase? He says, I'm getting ready to go to heaven. I'm getting ready to leave this earth. And I think that's the eager expectation we must live this life with. Is that this is not our home. Our bags are packed and we are ready to be transfigured and changed. And turned into the image of Jesus Christ. That we would be that dazzling light in transformation. And this is how God describes His church Jesus says that I'm returning for a radiant church without spot and without wrinkle. This is who we are. This is who we are. So try not to talk down about your church or anybody else's church. Because if you're doing that, you're just beating up the body of Christ. I think Ryan told me one day, uh, the church is the only people that cannibalize their own weak (laughs) The broken. The cannibalized, the broken. Let's love each other. Let's live in light of the fullness that we are going to be the transfigured and changed body of Christ one day.